Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the last uh, webinar of this series uh, for the year, for this um, current year. Um, we will have uh, Lucas presenting. Um, so Lucas is uh, Lucas is a professor of economics at uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires. He's also, of course, a research fellow at BEP and also at ESA. And his research focuses on labor market institutions in developing countries. Um, he, has, uh, he has an extensive uh, publication record on labor informality and enforcement. So uh, welcome, Lucas. Thank you for presenting today. Um, uh, just before before you present, um, you can you can use the Q and A box to type any questions you may have. Um, he will be presenting for around thirty minutes, maybe less, and and then after we have some time for questions and comments and discussion if something comes up. So, Lucas. Uh, Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Jenny, <clears throat> for the organization of this whole series of, of seminars, uh, which, are, which are great. Uh, apologize, I have very little voice, so I will, there is one advantage of that, that I will not speak too much. So um, we are, we will try to answer a big question. How do labor unions affect inequality and efficiency in, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is uh, the, the region where I have some expertise. This is a big question. And uh, in order to have labor unions, in order to have some impact on inequality and in, on, on efficiency, well, they should, they should have some power. And I have been, uh, in the paper I wrote, I tried to compute from a number of sources, a number of proxies of labor union strength. Usual proxies are uh, labor union density, the coverage of collective bargaining. Sometimes people use a number of strikes. And I have been collecting that information, not only from the ILO, which is useful, but, but pretty limited, but also from, from other sources, such as the Enterprise Survey, Latino Barometro, the World Value Survey, and so on. But there is one figure that I think properly summarizes all the evidence. There was one question asked in Latino Barometro. Latino Barometro is an opinion survey conducted all over Latin America, where well, they ask people, please, out of these eight institutions, which are, according to your opinion, the three most powerful? Well, on average, uh, well, Latin Americans, excuse me, they, they selected government, big business, political parties, so either business or, or politics as the most powerful institutions. Out of the eight institutions, labor unions was ranked as the least powerful institution, only selected by 12% of the population. So compare with, again, politics, big business, even the military, the media, and, 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 and the banking sector, labor unions are, are relatively weak. And I think that is, a, that is a, good, a good summary statistic of the mean power of labor unions in the region. Now, there is quite a lot, a lot of heterogeneity, mainly in two dimensions. One is across countries, and the other is across sectors. So there are a few countries, Argentina being uh, the extreme example, Mexico probably another one, where labor unions do enjoy 
some level of power. For example, in Argentina, labor unions are ranked as the fourth most powerful institutions. But in all these countries, even in Argentina, always big business and politics are, uh, according to the majority of the population, stronger than labor unions. And then you have other countries in the continent, as far as I know, Colombia or Guatemala, where basically labor unions are, have no strength at all. The other interesting uh, heterogeneity is that labor unions are about three times, well, labor union density is three times higher in the public sector than in the private sector. So labor unions in some uh, are, are, are powerful veto power when it comes to some provision on some public goods. And here we will immediately think about the public education sectors, um, uh, teachers, uh, labor unions as an important, uh, as an important component. Now, um, a bit of evidence about the evolution of labor union strength over time, we have very little the, the quality of the data is, is not very high, but it, it is reasonable to say that compared to the time where the region was following the import substitution industrialization, which at some time it got exhausted, uh, nowadays um, unions are, are, are less powerful than, than, than in the past. Let me move to the second point. And let me talk a bit about the complexity, the conceptual complexity to answer our objective. So we have received some theoretical frameworks from, from Europe or from North America about how, how unions affect inequality and efficiency. And I would argue that those conceptual frameworks do not easily fit in the in, in Latin America in the region. So let's start with the with the Marxist perspective. Basically, the idea is that the union movement um, is a struggle against capital for a more decent life, particularly for all workers and particularly for the for the most vulnerable workers. When you go when you go to the basic, to some basic descriptive statistics, you will find that in the region, for example, unions are very likely to organize high skilled workers. Union density among people with tertiary education or more is 21%, with only secondary education, 12%, with primary education or less, below 10%. So unions focus on skilled workers and also focus on, on big business, on those who have big rents. Uh, the figure here on the left, it is showing that um, um, unionized firms have much higher employees and, 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 and higher sales than, than non-union employees. So basically labor unions in the region uh, they are better. They are better characterized as social service providers, uh, organizations that have reached a kind of an agreement with capital and the state. So that is a better description rather than a, a revolutionary organization. Um, so, but this is most economists. We we easily agree. Uh, with the idea that the Marxist perspective has little applicability to understand labor unions in the region. However, let me argue that the other dominant approach, the neoclassical insider-outsider approach, uh, does not fit the region well either. So uh, let's remember the story here is that workers who already have a job, so the insiders, they want a, 
earn a salary above their productivity. And in order to do that, they organized, they formed a labor union, and with the labor union, they bargained for higher wages, or they put pressure in the, in the government to introduce some protective legislation, such as severance payment and, and so on. So according to this perspective, the main culprit for outsider strength, so the main reason why informal, unemployed, or subsistence self-employees are suffering in the region is labor unions. Labor union. So these guys should hate labor unions, according to this opinion, because their, their poor performance, their lack of jobs, their lack of high, higher wages, it is because of labor unions, according to this perspective. However, in work that I have been doing with some colleagues, with uh, Ravi Kambur and Santi Lopez Cariboni, we have been showing basic statistics that that is actually not the case. So, um, so, for example, here from Latino Barometer, we, were, we know the employment status of workers, whether they are self-employees, employees in the public sector, in the private, or unemployed. The data here does not allow to distinguish formal or informal employees. But anyway, each of these groups, about 75 80% both think that labor unions are necessary to defend workers. So the unemployed, 70% of the unemployed are saying that labor unions are necessary to defend workers. We conducted a short survey in, in, in Argentina asking people whether severance pay should be increased, kept as, as it is, or reduced according to the neoclassical insider-outsider model, you will expect that people who are unemployed or people who are, in, who are working under the table, that those guys will say, please reduce the severance pay because that is reducing the demand for labor and that is the reason why I do not get a job or why the only job I get is under the table. However, when you ask that question, among informal employees, only 2% want to reduce the severance payment. 83% want to increase severance payment. When you ask the unemployed, only 4% want to reduce the severance pay. Or 70, almost 70% want to increase. So what we are saying here is that there are a large number of assumptions between the neoclassical inside outsider model but this story, which argues that labor unions are the main reason for high inequality and for high inefficiency in the region, does not appear to be very adequate, at least to understand uh, Latin America and the, and the Caribbean. So let me move now. I did an effort to summarize the empirical literature. So let me, let me say three things. First, I want to congratulate people who have been trying to estimate a causal effect of unions on efficiency or on equality, because this is methodologically very challenging. Uh, the industrial relations system in Latin America not only varies across countries, but it, is, it has some characteristics that is not easy to estimate the causal effect. So the evidence is regrettably because of this is plagued with endogeneity concern. And uh, I'm, I'm, well, this is probably the reason why very few people dare to write, a, to, to, to write, to provide some, some evidence on, on, on the field. So there are very few, there are very few papers. And the few papers you find basically half are saying labor unions have a positive impact on efficiency, labor unions have a positive impact on equality, and the other half saying exactly the opposite. So, um, so now there is, there, is even, there is even a mixed record 
on how labor unions affect the political regime. This is something that political scientists have been studying. And according to some political scientists, labor unions have been a champion for democracy. They have been fighting against the, the dictatorships in, in a number of Latin American countries. But there is another, uh, another piece of, of evidence showing that in some countries, in some cases, the, the labor unions were collaborating with the, with the military. So again, a mixed result. I will say, this is my understanding, that there is a bit more of consensus about the negative effects on labor unions on two domains in Latin America, talking about uh, uh, my region. I will say that uh, labor unions in the public sector, they end up having a negative effect. We all know that human capital is fundamental for development. And labor and teachers unions with, who have particular power over the public sector and only the poor, uh, and the poor have no option to attend, not, uh, they only have the possibility to attend the public school. So they, they are not able to escape from the strikes conducted by, by public sector teachers unions. They oppose evaluation, they, they oppose a, a number of, of reforms that might make education quality higher. So that's, a, that's I would say, there's a bit more of consensus about that. And the other thing is that labor unions, particularly for employees, for public sector employees, they have been able to negotiate very high pensions, very high relative to the resources that we do have in, in our region, right? And this is an important source of fiscal deficit. If you go to a country like Brazil, uh, this, is, this is really, really uh, important. Santiago Levy has a number of, of estimates about that. So now let me move to the fourth point. And uh, uh, before moving there, let me say uh, one piece of, of evidence that there is consensus is about and labor unions, they do defend Employ, uh, employment uh, protection uh, legislation, EPL. Now, there is discussion about whether stringent EPL, is it, is it positive, is it negative for efficiency and equality or not? So let me move uh, uh, to that point. And so, so how does, Employ the stringency of employment protection legislation affects, affects the economy, affects wealth. Let me start saying one thing that is that should be obvious. We should go beyond the letter of the law. If a country has a labor code that says the minimum wage is this high, uh, workers, it is forbidden to fire a work. But then that labor code is on the shelves of a lawyer but has no applicability, it is not enforced at all in the economy. We cannot blame, we cannot blame what, what's going on in the labor market. We cannot blame that labor code, those protective labor regulations for what's going on in the labor market. So what we have to look is effective regulation. And an effective regulation is how, how the public sector intervenes into the labor market. And that is not only through the regulations, but, only through, but also through enforcement. And this is something we have been working with Ravi Kambur, for a number of years, basically to try to reply to this influential work from Laporte and other colleagues who have been arguing that uh, the jury, the letter that uh, countries that have more stringent employment protection legislation, they tend to have worse labor, uh, uh, labor market outcomes. And they were only looking at the letter of law. So they were basically kind of arguing that 
Bolivia is doing better, is doing worse than Canada because the labor code in Bolivia is basically more stringent than the labor code in Canada. The only thing is they, they forgot to mention that in Bolivia, 80% of workers uh, work under the, the table. So the applicability of the labor code in, in Bolivia is greater. So that's it. That's, that's one point that as labor economists from the developing world, we cannot follow the methodology that might be useful for, for a developed country where enforcement is high. It, it might be useful in those circumstances to only, to only look at uh, to only look at variation in the regulation in the developing world where, where the letter of the law is not always enforced, we need to look at effective regulation. And here is an interesting point where, the, where, where we know very little. How do labor unions affect enforcement? So there is a bit of work on this issue. I did a little bit, uh, Matt Amenwal at MIT did, did also a, a bit of work. A number of colleagues I did in Brazil are doing some, some effort. And uh, so, and there is a, it seems like labor unions, they, they promote enforcement, but sometimes they displace, they are able to capture the enforcement agency in some cases, by capturing the enforcement agency, they bring more resources to the enforcement agency. So there is, they end up, there is, the country ends up with higher, higher enforcement levels. But in other cases, they displace enforcement from going to the informal firms to go in to defend the interest of labor union members. So this is something that, that deserves more attention. Let me move to the last point. And, uh, and I, I would like to, to try to talk about policy. One thing that, uh, at least myself and a number of other research fellows from PEP, we tend to believe that research in social science and particularly applying to a developing country, it is particularly useful when it goes beyond something purely academic, when it's able to inform, to provide, to help designing welfare enhancing public policy. So let me do an effort um, um, uh, to talk about that. So um, I think the, when, when, we, when we think about the role of labor unions in Latin America, well, it is fundamental to take into account the context. Are labor unions in Latin America in dealing with the context where there is a lot of competition among business, where there is a lot of competition among, uh, among political parties, where the system is very transparent, where we have a, a meritocratic civil service, or are labor unions dealing in a situation in a very hierarchical, in a very hierarchical society where in the private sector you have a few dueño, patron, we say uh, caudillo, uh, we say in Spanish, uh, boss, I guess uh, you, you will say that in English, very hierarchical private sector and a very hierarchical uh, public sector. So about the private sector, uh, um, ben Snyder, um, um, uh, he has a lot to say about that. I will, I will not add nothing uh, today. So I wanted just to make a few comments and tell an anecdote about the role of labor unions dealing in a situation where the public sector is run by a few caudillos, by a few... Uh, 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 yeah, um, a few big important people instead of by sound political institutions. So, uh, and the example, uh, because because in the when you are dealing with a situation where the executive power is particularly strong 
and, and it tends to politicize the civil service, political parties are weak, the rule of law is easy breakable. Well, in this context, at least there is a possibility that perhaps labor unions will bring a longer term perspective to otherwise short side policy makers who are always only thinking about the next election. Perhaps labor unions might increase compliance, at least with labor regulations, and in a, in a society where the rule of law is always breakable, at least enforcing some, some law that would be, uh, that would be something positive. Uh, perhaps stronger labor unions in the public sector, perhaps they might promote a more a meritocratic, a more Bavarian bureaucracy uh, that will also implement uh, antitrust regulations. So perhaps, but perhaps labor unions uh, might be captured by the, by the powerful executive power. It might become politicized and, uh, uh, and, and, and corrupt. So, and that's an open question. And I think that uh, uh, it is an interesting research agenda where we have little evidence about that. Let me finish telling an, an, uh, an anecdote from my country, from Argentina. A few years ago, uh, when Nestor Kirchner was the president, he was not happy uh, with the inflation level, which was too high according to his opinion, and because of that, the poverty rate was too high. So uh, because he was not happy with that, uh, he manipulated the National Statistical Agency in Argentina. Argentina used to be one of the countries in Latin America that has a strongest and high quality statistical agency. But, you know, a strong executive power, he decided to intervene and manipulate the statistics so for a number of years, the inflation rate was substantial. It was, was kind of a joke because when you live in your own country, you realize that, the, that, that those figures are basically a joke. And, uh, and, and at that time, Argentina, at that time, uh, the prime minister of Argentina argued that Argentina has a poverty rate below that of Germany. So anyway, so a joke, really a joke. Anyway, so what happens with labor unions in the, who, who are strong in the, in the public sector when President Kirchner uh, did that? And basically what we have is that the main labor union, which is UPCN, they turn a blind eye. They say, this is the powerful guy, uh, let's turn a blind eye. We are not gonna defend the, the, the career employees that are working at the, at, the, at the statistical agency. Now, the other labor union, ATE, was one of the main organizations fighting against Kirchner, and at the end of the day was an important actor that helped restoring the independence of the, of the national statistical agency. So uh, with this example, I am trying to uh, at least to tell an anecdote about how labor unions uh, uh, can operate in such a complex a situation. So thank you very much for listening. I am open to questions. Thank you, Lucas, for this very interesting presentation. So, um, have any questions, you can use the Q&I uh, box or chat box, whatever you prefer. Question, comments, insights. If, if someone wants to turn on the mic and ask a question, I am happy with that. I don't know if that, that works or not. I think we have to give them permission to do so, but yeah, just ask.
So in the meantime, I have a question. <laughs> Just because we have people connected from other regions. Uh, so have you uh, start uh, uh, researching about uh, what happens in other regions in the world with labor unions, uh, how that compares to Latin America? Um, it's a very wide question and <laughs> just to spike some. <laughs> no, it's a, no, it's a good point, Carmen. Uh, there is a there is a, a, a paper published in the, the handbook of labor economics, if if, if I'm correct, by uh, Freeman, who is basically discussing labor market institutions in the developing world. And um, Basically, what you find, the, the first thing you find is that uh, there is, at least for labor economies, which we are used to work with very high quality data, there is, there is little data. Now, the, the, the little data tends to suggest that labor unions are on average quite weak much weaker than, than what, what I'm saying, particularly in the Southern Cone, much weaker than they are. And, and similar to, uh, to what's going on in, in, in Latin America, they are they usually, where labor unions have some presence, have some power, it is usually uh, in the public sector. And uh, so in some African countries, in the public sector, labor unions have, have, have some strength. Same, same in some Asian countries. Yeah, but, but beyond that, I have not been doing any, any, any particular work on that. Um, I have been working on the, on the issue of enforcement all over the world, right? But, but, but uh, not, mm -hmm. not only for you. Great. So Veronica uh, asked about uh, the differences among uh, uh, unions and union roles in Latin America within the regions, uh, because you, you focus a lot on Argentina and how that would compare to, to other labor unions in, in Latin America. So let me, uh, <clears throat> I was, uh, actually I was trying to, to provide when I was talking was trying to always to talk about the out what's going on on average in the region and uh, provide some examples and talk a bit about the, the heterogeneity. Let me see if this is um, if we can if we can see this table. Uh, this might help Veronica. Um, so here I collected data number of proxies, uh, union densities. Union density is usually defined as the share of workers who are unionized, but the share of workers or the share of employees, this, uh, uh, so the, the, the denominator is not, is not clear, it varies across, across sources of information, so, so, so figures are hard to compare. Another source of Another potential proxy of union power is the share of union as firm or the coverage of collective bargaining or the number of strikes conducted, whatever. So following these figures, you might say there's a group of five, six Latin American countries where you have uh, Uruguay, Mexico, Costa Rica, Brazil, Bolivia, and Argentina. In these countries, different measures of union density, at, at least they are above 15%, some countries close to 30%. A, a large share of, of, of firms are unionized because of erga omnes, because of erga omnes, which basically applies at what is set in the collective bargaining, applies to all workers in that sector of activity, independent of being part of a labor union or not, because of Erga omnes, a large share of workers are collected by, by collective bargaining. And when you ask people whether, um, whether they think that labor unions are, are a powerful institution or not, at least in many of these countries, they rank out of eight institutions, they rank somewhere like five, six, seven, whatever. 
Now, uh, 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 um, as we mentioned, Veronica, this is this is the group of so this in these countries, labor unions, you might say they are as powerful as labor unions either in North America or in or in Europe, on average, on average. But then you have the large majority of countries. I try to cover to compute statistics for every country in the region. Bermuda, Chile, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, so on and so forth, where, as you can see, there are a, a, a large number of empty spots because uh, uh, the amount of evidence is, uh, is quite limited. But here you will find that density rates are usually in the order of 10%. Uh, uh, erga omnes does not exist. So the coverage of collective bargaining is much lower. The share of firms that are unionized is also lower. Uh, and then, well, in some countries, uh, such as, for example, in Colombia, there is no protection for labor union leaders. So they are, they are basically killed. So, uh, or, or, or in Chile, labor unions have basically no political power with respect to big business. Um, so uh, in these countries, they are, they are, they are, they are in, a, in, a, in a weaker position. And finally, and of course, this, categoriz this categorization is very subjective. You can, you can change it a bit more or less. But then there is, an, there is a number of countries. I put Belize, Guatemala, and IT. But basically, there are some countries in the region where you might say labor unions are basically almost non-existent. They basically have no power. So I don't know if that if that helps Veronica. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I forgot that that uh, nobody people have no access to the meat. So well, they're not talking, but uh, she says uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, Noe Carrias was asking about uh, labor unions in Belize. I think uh, that uh, you kind of answer with that table because it's practically uh, non-existent, as you said, right? Again, uh, you, even in the countries where, where labor unions are quite weak, in some place in the public sector, you might find you might find a labor union. And even in that case, it might have a little bit of a bit of power over certain. For example, the, the, uh, uh, the public education sector. In almost every country in the region, there is, a, there, is a, there is a labor union organizing public sector teachers. And in some of those countries, the labor union is very, very strong. Remember, we have in Mexico, el Sindicato Nacional de Trabajo de la Educación, it has, uh, I think it's something like 1.5 million members. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, the largest labor union in, in, in the continent. And, um, and in some cases, when, when the labor union, when a single labor union has monopoly of, of representation, uh, uh, then, then you can be in trouble. Anyway, yeah. More questions? Let me, let me take the mic, Carmen, because uh, we are, at the same time, we are trying to develop or to help improve our research fellows program. And I think one, one point I want to emphasize uh, is the situations where the methodologies that are useful to understand what's going on in the North, they do not apply well to understand what's going on in the developing world. Let me, let me start with a very simple example. 
For example, in the US, a firm can be unionized and another firm in the same sector of activity might not be unionized because unionizations occurs at the firm level. So you might exploit variation across firms to understand the, to try to measure the impacts of labor unions. That is not the case in Latin America, in most Latin American countries, because of, of a different industrial relations system, where labor unions, first they can impact regulations that affect all, or because of collective bargaining and erga omnes, this Latin word erga omnes, which means that what is set in the collective agreement applies to all workers, to all firms in the sectors, regardless of being affiliated to the labor union or not, requires a different type of methodology. So we cannot simply try to, uh, uh, to follow uh, the same methodologies. Now, uh, because of that, should we stop? Should we leave these questions and answer? Should we stop studying these issues particularly in a continent where inequality is very high and labor unions are a potential instrument that society has to reduce inequality. Um, so, so simply because the methodologies used in the North do not apply to our region, we should not uh, do research about important subjects. I believe no, I believe no. And uh, um, so that's that's one thing that I want I want to emphasize. That's a great point, actually. So thanks. Can give some time for people to type the questions or comments if they have, or raise their hands to jump in. Usually, whenever I start, you know, saying goodbye, a, a question pops up. <laughs> <That's>, <yeah. laughs> so, no worries if there are no questions. It was because my presentation was very clear. It was very clear, actually. <laughs> so, thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, thank you, Lucas, and thanks for joining all the the, the webinars before. Um, we will have more coming next year, so we'll keep you informed about that. Um, thank you again, and um, have a good holiday time. <laughs> good end of the year. Thank, thank you, and, uh, Carmen yeah. and Jenny. Thank you, Carmen and Jenny, for organizing the, the seminar, which is a great work, great work. Thank you. Well, thank you for presenting and um, and the seminar has been recorded. So if you want to go um, over it again, you have the chance uh, in the website where it was uh, it was uh, notified. So thank you and have a good rest of the day. Bye.